All right, guys, uh, let's start this. So um, let's begin this talk by talking about what exactly an internship at a big tech company is. So an internship is when you are basically hired as a full-time software engineer for the period of three months. The company will generally give you a project to work on and you might have a couple milestones throughout the internship uh, that you'll need to hit. And if you do well in the internship, there is the opportunity to be offered a full-time job at the end of it. Um, so before I explain how you can get an internship, uh, I'll first uh, say a little bit about myself. So I am not this student that um, killed high school and got top grades uh, throughout my whole life. I actually played computer games playing RuneScape throughout my entire high school years and <laughs> and I didn't really do much in high school. I wasn't that uh, focused, I wasn't that committed, I didn't really care about my own education and I ended up failing high school. Um, I spent the following few years lost, not really knowing what to do with my life, um, still playing lots of computer games, you know, partying a lot and uh, not really having much direction in life. And when I decided uh, to finally do something with my life, I was already 21 years old. And I knew I needed to make a change, so I decided to come to university and do a degree in computer science. Uh, when I came to university, I met a couple guys in the year above me and I met them at a social event at a quiz night and they told me that they were interning at uh, Google and Microsoft and this just completely blew my mind when I heard this. I didn't realize it was possible that students from a, a, a university such as ours could do something that I had deemed impossible. And I clung to these guys and got them to teach me everything they knew and I listened to everything they said. I worked really, really hard. I spent months reading books and practicing problems and doing mock interviews and I, and I did all their teachings and it worked throughout my university undergraduate degree. I interned at Palantir, Microsoft. Google, Atlassian, and I've also been offered a Facebook internship as well. So I didn't come from a place where I was always succeeding, but I'm just trying to highlight that uh, you don't have to already be succeeding to succeed. If you decide to succeed, to, to succeed now, you can. You just need to put your mind to it. So that's why you're here. That's why you've all come to this talk. And maybe let's have a, uh, a little talk about how can you also get an internship. So I'm going to try and pass it forward and get you guys hopefully into these companies as well. So what I'm going to be speaking about um, today is going to be split up into four main things. First, I'm going to be speaking about how you can uh, land the interview. So what do you need to do and what experiences do you need to build in order for, an in for, a, re for a recruiter to uh, take you uh, on and give you an interview. Then I'm going to be speaking about uh, what specifically do you need to study. So I'm going to give you uh, a list of things that you need to know and I'm also going to show you exactly how to learn them. And if you follow everything and do everything in this list, that is enough to get an internship at Google or one of these companies. Then I'm going to go through and I'm going to speak about uh, when you're trying to practice these problems and get better at coding uh, in preparation for passing interview, uh, technical algorithm interviews, I'm going to show you how exactly do I study and how I teach um, other students to study uh, and how to practice these problems. And then I'm going to be going and uh, speaking quite in depth about mock interviews, uh, which I believe as one of the, as I believe to be one of the most important part of this process. Uh, because a mock interview, or a real interview, sorry, goes for uh, a, a limited amount of time and you need to hit the, um, the nail on the head every single, time, every single minute of that interview. You need to answer behavioral problems and then you need to 
solve these algorithm problems for two different problems sometimes in a very short amount of time. And if you don't practice properly and if you don't prepare for it, you're most likely going to fail the interview. So I'm going to walk you through of what you can do, how to practice mock interviews so you don't fail when you have your live interviews. So getting an interview. The, the person that you need to impress when you're trying to land the interview is the recruiter. And the main thing that the recruiter is looking for is people or students that are passionate. So they want to try and figure out who is going to be the student that if they take them in as an intern, they are going to succeed and they are going to end up becoming a full-time employee. And it's, it is not clear how you can show an interviewer that you are passionate uh, about computer science. Um, however, if you follow this list that I have here, I believe that if you hit everything um, that I'm going to present to you, that it is enough. And if you do everything uh, and a recruiter sees your resume afterwards with this list, then that should show them that you are passionate and they will likely give you an interview. So let's talk about the resume. The resume uh, should be one single page. And yes, it should include some of, your, some of your, your skills, like what programming languages you know and what university uh, you've been to. But the three main things that you need to have is you need to have some sort of work experience, you need to have some sort of personal projects, and you need to have been involved in the community. So work experience. Now, uh, it's... This is a tough one because uh, I know most of you are sitting here to try and to figure out how to get an internship, uh, but I'm telling you that you need an internship in order to get an internship, and that is not true. Um, the things that I'm going to tell you to do to get an internship uh, are things that you can do right now. And the first one, the most I think one of the, uh, the, the most important ones uh, is some sort of research or project with a professor. And that can come in two forms. You can get a, uh, a summer research scholarship, so you can apply with your faculty, or if you have a, a lecturer that knows who you are, you can talk to them and, and try and get a, pro a project, which usually goes for six weeks over the summer, um, and they pay you for it, and that counts as work experience. Chuck that down on your resume as work experience. Another thing you can do, um, and this one isn't really known about, but if you have any um, professors or your lecturers um, that, you, um, that you have some sort of positive relationship with, then you can ask them uh, if they can give you any projects to work on. Now, uh, uh, most of them do have stuff uh, and work ready to, like, a lot of them have work ready to go, and they want people to work with them, um, but they, uh, they don't openly promote these jobs because uh, they might only need one person. And you'll be surprised, the majority of the lecturers and the professors out there don't have anyone working on uh, some of the projects um, that they need done. So guaranteed, if you speak to professors, speak to lecturers, to try and get some uh, uh, projects, you can definitely do that. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not that hard to, uh, to go and knock on their door and uh, like, these two things just look really good on the resume and they count as work experience. Now, the last, the last thing is, there are, like, like, this one might take a bit more work, but it's definitely doable, and that is to apply for brand new startup companies that are opening up. I mean fresh. I mean, they only have one, zero, two, three employees, like software engineers, and they need to get a lot of work done, and they need, and they really uh, will take anybody. Uh, if you've coded for six months, if you've coded for one year, and you uh, reach out to them and tell them that you're keen, they'll take you. And it doesn't take much work. And you can do some work with them for six months or a year, or, or however, however, however long you need. But that is another good way to add work experience to the resume without necessarily getting into a big company. So personal projects. So what you need to be doing is you should be working on projects uh, and some sort of programming, um, some sort of program outside of the university learning realm. You should 
Uh, if you want to make an app or if you uh, want to make a game, the game doesn't have to be uh, super complex. You could, it could be text-based or, or it could be some graphics that you, that you display in the terminal. Or if you were feeling up for it, you can um, have a go and learn one of the bigger um, game, uh, game engines like Unity um, or Unreal. But uh, like there are some ideas for some games. Um, or what you can do is um, learn how to make a website. So if you already know how to make a website, that's great. Make one. Put that down as a personal project on the resume. If you don't know how, it, uh, it, the, the, the three languages that make up the basics of, of a website, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, aren't too complicated. They're easy to learn than C++, which most of you um, would have experienced. So, uh, and if you want to um, build a website, then there are tons of tutorials out there. And these are some great ways to get some personal projects on the resume. Next one is community involvement. Now, uh, if you do the last two and you get work experience and you get personal projects, then uh, it, there is a major part of this whole process that you're missing. And that is the networking that you get from community involvement. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I first learned this information, I met a couple guys at some club event, and they were the ones who were able to pass this information on to me. You need to be involved in community activities and club events. Because if, you, um, if, you, if, you, if you're not involved, then you're missing out on a lot of advice and a lot of motivation that you get from, from knowing a friend who is also trying to get a job at Google. And so the first one is uh, clubs. So there are tons of clubs. This, this talk is uh, hosted uh, by four great clubs. Uh, and you can s sign up at the back there. Um, uh, no shameful plug right there. But uh, if you get involved in club activities, then this is your opportunity to meet people and to find um, other people who are trying to uh, reach the same goals you are. Um, next one is competitions. So there are two types of competitions. There are, oh, there are two types of competitions that are mainly participated in by students. And one of them is a hackathon, and the other one is a competitive programming competition. A hackathon is when you uh, have these industry leaders or these uh, uh, some employees of companies, maybe local, maybe uh, maybe uh, maybe national, and they will present a bunch of problems, and you work in groups uh, of maybe up to five people, uh, solving uh, one of their problems, and at the end of the competition, each team will pitch their solution, and uh, the, um, the the panel of judges will decide who the winner is. A uh, competitive programming competition, on the other hand, is when you have about six hours and you, and you work in teams of about three, and you need to try and solve as many algorithms as possible within the six hours. And basically, the team that solves the most algorithms wins. Um, both of these things look excellent on the resume, and they are a huge indication that you are passionate about computer science. Um, and there are a few other things. So you can get involved in uh, being a peer mentor for the faculty. You can become a faculty ambassador. You can help out at O Week and open days. You can uh, do some private tutoring. All of these things, once again, are excellent indicators that you are passionate about the community and about computer science. So. Once you've uh, uh, done all that stuff, or uh, this stuff you should be doing uh, constantly, start as soon as possible. Um, but you, uh, when you apply for these big companies, there is usually uh, up to three uh, boxes where you can give and supply the application form with some websites. So they may ask for a LinkedIn and a GitHub and maybe a personal profile website. When you um, I recommend that you create all three of these. So your LinkedIn, make sure you've got your, uh, a good picture up. Make sure you have an About Me section. Uh, all the stuff on your resume, put all of that in your LinkedIn. Really fill it out. Uh, when you do make your GitHub, all the personal projects that you've done and all of the university assignments that you've done, put those things uh, uh, in uh, your GitHub um, so recruiters and interviewers can look through it and see your code um, if they want to. And the last one is a personal profile website. And uh, it's not too difficult to create one. Uh, there are templates out there where you can download an already completed uh, personal profile website. 
And if you simply download this website and replace the images and the text with your name and your, and, and, and your pictures, then boom, now you have a profile website. And you can host the website for free on GitHub. So these three things take a bit of work. They need, you, know, you need to invest time into it, but all of these things will get you noticed by recruiters and increase your chances of receiving that Google interview. Um, now, the, the last one is referrals. So if you do everything that I've just said, um, but you don't have a referral, you, it may still take a few months, uh, or uh, I've, I've even um, seen a situation where someone hasn't got an interview for, for six months. Uh, without referrals, it can take a long time to get noticed by some companies. Sometimes it's quick uh, if you don't have a referral, but but there is a chance that it, it will take a long time. And there is a surefire way you can guarantee yourself to have an interview faster, and that is to get a referral. So th there are two types of referrals. There is an official referral where you get a full-time employee who is working at that company, or maybe you know someone who is currently interning in the middle of their internship at that company. That person can log on to the web portal internally and fill out a form to refer you. And these people who refer you have a huge incentive to uh, referring people that are good because if you manage to successfully get the internship and from the internship you get a grad job, then they will get a reward of up to $5,000 sometimes. Um, so they have a huge incentive to, to refer you, so don't feel afraid to ask for referrals. So um, the other one is an unofficial referral. So if you know somebody who has interned at a company or has worked at a company that you would like to work at, then and that person is still in positive communication with that recruiter, then you can ask this friend of yours to email their recruiter and give their recruiter your resume. And Yes, this person isn't officially referring you, so they're not going to get any $5,000 reward, but the purpose of getting a referral is to get your application looked at sooner. And if you get your application looked at sooner, then, uh, then you, you know, have a higher chance of, 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 of getting the interview because they may be only taking a certain amount of people um, each year, and so you really want to be in there quick. So with all that, now we know how to get an interview. Now let's talk about uh, uh, the process of how do we pass the technical interviews. So the first thing is how do you learn all the things that you need to learn and what are those things? First one is myself and the mentors who taught me and the students that I've taught, uh, we have all read this book, Cracking the Coding Interview. It is the Bible of most of us. We, we, I have gone back and read it a few times uh, because the information is really, really good. Um, and what the book is, is nearly 200 problems uh, where you can uh, solve interview style coding problems and at the back of the book are their answers. So you can get that book and you have a whiteboard and you can solve the problem and then once you've solved the problem you can go and uh, see if your solution is correct by, um, by reading it and improve that way. However, at the start of the book, um, the first 86 pages is a, a really good overview of all the stuff that you should know about how to get into these companies. Basically, uh, I, this is a must for all of you, read the first 86 pages of this book. And once you've read the first 86 pages of this book, uh, you'll move on to learning the, uh, the algorithms and the data structures. So uh, this is the book that I recommend to um, all of my students and was the book recommend, um, I recommended, to my me, recommended to me. Uh, there are other sources online where you, can, where you can learn this stuff, but this is just the method that I use that works. So uh, the next thing is to read the first 10 chapters of the algorithm design manual. Now this book is tougher to get through than the first 86 pages of Cracking the Coding Interview, but 
That's because it's teaching you some of these algorithms and, and some of these technical things for the first time. And it's natural that uh, some of it might go over your head and you might not understand some stuff. But if that happens, and if you come across something that you don't understand, then what you should do is put a bookmark in this book, close it, and go to Google, go to YouTube, and keep searching and keep watching videos and keep learning about that one thing you didn't understand until you understand it. Just keep watching YouTube videos and keep going. Once you've understood that concept, then go back to the algorithm design manual, open up the book where you left off and continue. So throughout this entire process, what you need to be doing is going back and forth between reading the book and self-study every time you uh, don't understand something. Now, if you get to something that you don't understand, under no circumstances should you write that thing down and say to yourself that you'll get to it later. And the reason why I'm so adamant about this is there are things earlier on in the book that the parts later on build upon. And, it's, and there are going to be more and more things that you don't understand. The volume is going to start increasing if you do decide to write things down and tell yourself that you're going to learn about it later. Don't do that. Learn it as soon as you read it and make sure that by the time you finish the book, you understand everything. And the last thing I wanted to say about this book is whilst you're going through it, you will come across some algorithms and data structures that you have never seen before or you, you have never coded before. And before moving forward, while you're going through the book, stop and code everything along the way. If you've never coded a binary tree before and you just finished the binary tree chapter, stop and code up a binary tree, et cetera, et cetera, for all the different data structures and algorithms. So once, you've, uh, so once you've gone through this book, uh, you know a bunch of algorithms and, and data structures. But what uh, I wanted when I was learning was I wanted my mentors to give me a finite list. And I wanted them to tell me that if you learn everything on this list, then that is enough to pass Google interviews. So this is the list that I'm providing to you guys. Um, the slides will be available online in, in, case I, um, in case you miss writing some of them down. But so the first one is data structures. So all of these data structures uh, are really important and they will come up in your interviews. It may seem a lot right now, but if you dedicate your time, you will be able to get through them all. So there's linked lists, binary trees, graphs, tries, stacks and queues, vectors, hash tables, and union find. Uh, these are all different data structures that are useful to solve algorithms in interviews. So the next one is, uh, is the different algorithms that are very common. So if you have a grid or you have a graph and you want to traverse it, then you need to understand how to code a depth-first search algorithm and a breadth-first search algorithm. And if you have an array of sorted numbers, then you need to know how to, uh, how to search through that array using a binary search algorithm. If you have an unsorted array, you need to understand and have implemented both merge sort and quick sort algorithms. You, if you have a tree, you need to understand how to insert things into that tree and how to find elements in that tree. Um, if you have a, a grid and a graph and you want to find the shortest point between, between two points, uh, a very common algorithm is Dijkstra's pathfinding algorithm. You need to understand uh, and, have a, and have coded it at least once, uh, um, Dijkstra's pathfinding algorithm. And the last thing is if you want to find the nth largest element in an array, you need to understand the quick select algorithm. Now, here are some extra concepts that don't necessarily fall in the category of of data structures or algorithms, but they are still really important to know because if an interviewer asks you and they, and they ask you about any of these concepts and you don't know them, then you're going to be in trouble and you will likely fail that interview. So just make sure you know these concepts. Uh, there's bit manipulation. Um, there are, there's a uh, singleton and factory design pat pattern. You need to understand how memory works. You, you need to have a very solid grasp on what is the stack and what is the heap. Uh, you need to know how to make functions call themselves uh, using recursion. And the most important thing out of this entire list that I've said is you need to have an extremely solid understanding of 
big O complexity time. So whenever you are given a problem in an interview and they want to uh, and they and they want you to solve an algorithm, uh, um, they want you to come up with an algorithm that solves the problem. What they're doing is they're not necessarily asking you to just come up with any algorithm that can solve the problem. They are specifically asking you to figure out an algorithm that will solve it in the most efficient way possible. And big O time is how we quantify how efficient an algorithm is. So it is the, the center point of all uh, algorithms and data structures, uh, oh, sorry, of, of, of all technical interviews. So now we know uh, what we need to study and we know how we can study those things. Now let's talk about uh, applying that knowledge and actually doing some real world problem solving. Uh, oh, real world problem solving. So actually writing some code that compiles and runs. So when the, like, like the first thing that you need to uh, uh, go to, once you've read the books, Something I didn't mention before, before I move on to this leak code slide, is don't move on to leak code and don't move on to problem solving until you have studied all of the theory. And the reason for that is because you will come across uh, different uh, ideas and different algorithms that require you and assume that you understand some of these basic uh, fundamental concepts. And if you don't understand these basic fundamental concepts, then you're going to waste your own time and it's, it's going to be slower for you to learn and, and you, know, you would have saved time just, just spending the time studying the theory in the first place. So don't move on to problem solving until you've read uh, those two books and you understand all of those uh, things that I listed before. So uh, once you're ready to solve some problems, um, you can move on to LeetCode. I personally, when I first uh, got an internship. Uh, this was um, before some of these websites had, had really started up and I did all of my problem solving using the cracking the coding interview problems and I did them on a whiteboard and that did uh, help me land my first two internships. But uh, as I've been going uh, forwards, um, I have come across websites that make it way easier um, and leak code being one of them. LeetCode uh, is a big database collection of uh, more than 1,500 problems, and these problems are problems that interviewers ask you in big tech Silicon Valley company interviews. Now, when I say 1,500, that may scare away a lot of you because you might think to yourself, hang on a minute, like, there's no way that I could ever possibly learn 1,500 problems, and hopefully I can convince you otherwise. When you're trying to learn problems on LeetCode, uh, there is only really 100 to 150 tricks that repeat over and over and over again. And what you need to do is put the time in and to do LeetCode problems to expose yourself to these different ideas. And once you have been exposed to, I don't know, uh, 80 plus uh, different ideas by doing LeetCode problems, then that really is enough for you to uh, pass one, uh, some of these interviews. And if you uh, want to be absolutely sure, then, uh, then maybe uh, try and learn 100 different ideas. But really, it's, uh, the work you put in is what you get out. If you put in lots of time and you, and you expose yourself to more and more lead code problems, then you will uh, be more robust to uh, to failing interviews uh, in, like when you get there. So um, some other things I, I wanted to speak about. So in LeetCode, there are three different uh, difficulty categories, easy, mediums, and hards. And uh, my suggestion is throughout the entire time when you're doing LeetCode problems, so from the start, keep uh, as, much, as close as you can to the ratio of 30% easies half of the mediums and 20% hards. And this ratio um, really applies to, to the people who uh, maybe first years who have not been ex exposed to 
competitive programming type problems before. If you if you've done uh, up to you know past second year of programming, you've done ADSA and uh, you've done competitive programming events, then what I would be doing is really lowering the amount of easies and upping the amount of hards um, because that's really gonna m make you more robust to to failing problems uh, in a live interview. Uh, and something else that I believe is really important is timing yourself when you do leak code problems. When you're in a real interview, there is a clock ticking, and that clock ticking is stressful. And if you're not used to a clock ticking, then uh, there is a chance that when you uh, do a real interview, you're going to freeze up or it's going to, it's going to distract you to the point that you'll fail the interview. And to help us become um, immune to this, to, um, to the fear of the clock ticking, or maybe not immune, but help us manage it and be okay with it, uh, what we can do is always use a stopwatch when you do a leak code, and as soon as you finish the leak code problem, you, uh, uh, you record that time. Now, um, something I believe is the most important thing about doing these problems. And there are two types of people who do leak code problems, and one of them has a low chance of passing interviews, and one of them, I believe, has a much higher chance. And that is how much time you spend on a problem. If, you get, if, you, if you're doing a problem and you can't figure out the solution in 10, 20 minutes, you might throw up your hands and give up and say, ah, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand how to, how to solve this. I'm just gonna stop this now, hit the stopper on the, on the stopwatch, and then go and look up the solution. Now, uh, that uh, has um, its benefits. Uh, the benefits that you might think are that allows you to get through more problems uh, than, you, than you could have if you spent longer. But there is an issue. If you do a problem and you don't understand the solution in 10, 20 minutes, and you jump to the um, uh, and then you go and read the solution, and let's say, hypothetically, that you read through the entire solution and you really understand at that moment in time what that solution is telling you, then there is a high chance that when a real interview comes two, three, four months later, and let's say in a, in a real interview they happen to give you that same problem, there is a good chance that you are not going to remember that solution. And that's because you didn't really connect any emotion to that problem. And this is a technique that I've used constantly and it's, it's worked for me, and that is to put yourself through pain. You need to traumatize yourself. You need to sit there and bang your head against the wall trying to solve that problem. Come up with three, four, five different approaches and try all of them. Really, really, really explore everything you could possibly ever do. Um, if, you, if you feel like there isn't anything more you can do, spend an extra half an hour or an hour trying to think of something else. And if you do this, and if you really put yourself through this anguish, then you will find, and then you finally stop and give up after a few hours, then when you go and read the, uh, the solution, it's gonna be this light bulb you know, eureka moment. You're gonna think, oh my God, that's how it's done. I've been thinking about this for hours. This makes so much sense now. You have now connected uh, an emotion to this problem. And that way, when you reach a real interview in three, four months time from now, you will, uh, it will bring back all those same emotions that you had when you were trying to solve it uh, four months ago. And you will most likely remember the solution straight away. So um, now let's have a look at uh, how exactly should you study um, problems correctly? Because I believe that there is uh, also optimal ways to study to help you remember uh, problems correctly. So. When you do leak code problems, there is, uh, and, and you finish it or you don't finish it, and you flip over to the solutions panel, uh, it will supply you with one, two, or like one to five uh, solutions to that problem. And the solution at the top of the, of the page will be the worst solution, it will be the most inefficient. Um, and as you go down the page, the one at the bottom will be the most efficient solution. So, uh, what you should be doing is you should be reading through every single solution on on the leak code page uh, on the leak code solutions page and you should be 
doing your best to understand every single solution they have. And attached to every single solution is also the, the big O complexity of that solution. So when you're reading through the solutions, you should also put a bunch of time and energy into making sure you understand why each solution has that complexity. Why is it big O n log n? You need to think about it. If you don't understand it, just like reading uh, the algorithm design manual, stop, pause, go to YouTube and, and look up that question or go to the discussions page of, of, of the LeetCode um, solutions uh, um, the discussions for that question on LeetCode and do a bunch of research and really think about it to try and figure out why each solution has, uh, has that complexity. So once, you've, once you're going down the list and you've, you're understanding the solutions as they go, you will reach the last solution. And this is the most important one. You need to put your time into understanding why uh, I, so everything that I've said about the rest of them, you, you, you really need to understand the last one. And let's say that you didn't uh, manage to solve that problem, then you should go back and delete the code you had before and re-implement it using the, the optimal solution. And if you go through this process, so you spend a few hours in pain going through the question, and then you finally get to the end and you, and you read the solutions and you understand the solution and you, and you recode up the solution, then when you hit a real interview, you will not only remember uh, a solution to that, to that uh, problem, you will remember the optimal solution. And and basically, that's, that's the process you need to do if you want to have the highest chance of, of, of passing um, yeah, uh, these algorithms, of uh, uh, these technical interviews. So when you stop the stopwatch and you stop recording the time for the problem you are doing, uh, my recommendation is to graph all of the times. So have a separate uh, line on your line graph for the, different, um, for the three different difficulties of leak code problems. And you should, you should basically make your graph look something similar to this. And uh, the reason why this is so helpful is because it almost gamifies the process of of practicing these problems. You know, it becomes exciting uh, once you get better and better at it because you know that when you hit, um, uh, when you hit that stopwatch and then, and then you hit stop uh, at the end of it, uh, you're hoping that you can improve your time and the graph should have a, a slowly downwards trend of you getting faster and faster and faster at these problems. And something else you should do to this graph is in a real interview, uh, if you're given an easy problem, then you really should uh, uh, be finishing that easy problem in under 10 minutes. Uh, for mediums, you should be doing them in under 25 minutes. And in an interview, if you're given a hard problem, you should be doing them in, in under 40 minutes. And something else I suggest you do in, uh, in this graph is keep track of how many easies did you successfully complete under 10 minutes. So let's say 45% uh, uh, of the easies I've done on LeetCode I uh, solved in under 10 minutes, then what you should do is you should, is you should put that percentage on your spreadsheet so you can always see it. Every time you add a new time and a new, a new question to this spreadsheet, then it's going to always update and give you some sort of, um, it, um, it, it, it will quantify how well you're doing. So use these techniques to get better and better at problem solving. And if you do this over time, then you should uh, eventually be good enough to solve problems. Um, and the last point before I move on to mock interviews is what you should be doing is you really should be uh, solving up to 150 problems. So if you have done zero programming before, um, so if, if you've never done any competitive programming before and these types of problems are new to you, um, I definitely recommend 100 to 150. And the reason why there is so many is because there are simply so many tricks and different ideas that interviewers could, could throw at you. And you really just need to try and expose yourself to as many problems as possible. So, so yeah, so that's exactly how to practice these problems and get good enough at algorithms. You, you read those books, you do this leak code, you time yourself, you do 150 of them. If you do this, you will be good enough uh, at 
at problem solving that you can pass Google interviews. I, I guarantee it. Uh, if, if you put the time in and, 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 and energy in, you will be good enough to pass these interviews. The final part of this talk is to have a chat about mock interviews. So a, a mock interview or a, a real interview or the, the, the structure of an interview uh, is as follows. They typically uh, go for 45 minutes. These are for the big tech company interviews. They typically go for 45 minutes. And you will be asked a few warm-up questions at the, at the beginning, uh, some behavioral questions that usually go for five to 10 minutes. And then typically you will get asked two questions. Not, not all interviews you get asked two questions, sometimes only one. But uh, I think it's important that when you're doing your mock interviews that you prepare yourselves for the hardest version of what an interview can be. So that is to do a, a technical interview that's an easy problem and then straight after that uh, do a leak code medium problem. So w what you usually do is you find other people, so other people in this room, and you pair up and... When you are giving an interview to your friend, you will make sure that the problem that you are giving them is a problem they have not seen before. So give them an easy and a medium leak code problem that they haven't done before because they need to experience uh, uh, trying to solve problems for, for the first time live in, in interviews. And uh, the rule is, is the person who is giving the interview uh, starts a stopwatch when the interview begins and as soon as 45 minutes hits then the person giving the interview stops the mock interview um, and if they have not uh, if they have not finished um, uh, what they were doing, if the interviewee was still in the middle of trying to solve the problem then you will label that mock interview as a failure and what you should be doing is constantly doing mock interviews and passing and failing each other until you get to the point that you feel confident enough that you can pass mock interviews. So the first part of a mock interview, that first five, 10 minutes, um, you, your interviewer will likely have your resume in front of them, or if they don't, they may just ask you some other questions. But uh, this will be the moment where you need to answer some behavioral questions. And like I said uh, before, uh, it, not all interviews you will get a behavioral questions. Sometimes they'll just dive straight into a technical question, but often you will get um, a behavioral question. So uh, to one of the big things that you don't want to do when uh, answering a behavioral question is you don't want to be uh, fumbling or you don't want to be having to stop and think to try and answer their question. Whenever they ask any question, you should immediately have an answer and you should be immediately able to jump on that answer. And in order to do this, you just need to be prepared. So what you do is all of the personal projects or group assignments at university or work experience that you've, that, that you've had, uh, you put down as columns of the table. And the most common six pro uh, behavioral questions that you can get asked, you, you, you write them down uh, and, and you have them as the, the rows of the table. And what you need to do is think about every single intersection of this table and have a long think and come up with a story that answers this uh, question. And when you uh, are given this, um, when you are given one of these questions, when you tell the story, uh, you should be answering the question using the star technique, or that is a technique that is very, very, um, very helpful. So if you, if you don't really know how you should speak and tell your story, simply blindly follow the star technique, and that's a sure way uh, of passing that, that portion of the interview. Um, so the star technique is where you break up your answer into situation, task, action, and result. Uh, and I recommend going to YouTube, going to Google, and just looking up how the star technique works. And there are some really good uh, YouTube videos that 
give you some live demonstrations of people answering questions in, in the star format. So all of the intersections of your behavioral uh, spreadsheet, you need to be able to uh, answer using the star, um, the, um, the, uh, the star technique. So once you have finished the behavioral question, you will, uh, you will get one or two technical uh, questions. And when you solve um, technical questions, I recommend following this, uh, uh, these five steps. So you will repeat these five steps for each technical question, one after another. So the first one is uh, you need to first confirm the question to make sure you understand what they're asking you. Then you design the algorithm and figure out what the complexity of your algorithm is. Then you do the code only once you've uh, figured out what the algorithm is. And then at the end, you test your code. So let's uh, go through each of these one by one. So confirming the question. So one of the most common ways that people fail uh, interviews for big tech companies, and this is honestly the easiest way to fail because it's, uh, it's so hard to get right. And that is to make sure that when you do uh, uh, solve the problem, that you understand very, very well what exactly is the problem they were asking. And some of you may jump the gun because you might hear the question and you might think to yourself immediately, oh, yep. Yeah, I know this question, I've seen something similar, similar before. And you'll move on and you'll start solving the algorithm. But chances are you've missed this little piece of information on the, on the side here. And because you missed that piece of information, you are now solving a different problem. And if they notice this, if they notice that you are now solving the wrong problem, it doesn't matter if you, if you do really well in that wrong problem, you will fail that interview. So you, you have to make sure that you are so solving the correct problem. So to do this, you can do the following. The first thing you do, even if you are cocky and you're confident and you know and you, you feel pretty damn sure what the, the question was, doesn't matter. Repeat it back to them in your own words. And so if they ask you a question, you repeat it back in, in, in a different way, or just repeat it back in general. Just make sure that what you heard was correct. And, uh, and one of the best techniques that you should be doing is if they give you a problem, and they might give you an example input and output to the function. And what you should do is come up with your own different input and output. So basically, it would look something like this. If an interviewer um, gives me a problem, and I'm, tr and, I'm, and I'm trying to come up with my own input output, I might say, all right, so, uh, so what you're telling me is if I have this array with these four numbers, that this should be the answer, is that correct? And like, that's, like, that's something that I would say to the interviewer, because I'm just really trying to make absolutely sure that I understand what the problem is. And I have done this many, many times in interviews where I've come up with input and output. And uh, when I've given them the output, the interviewer looks at what I'm doing and says, no, 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 you, you've missed something. It actually should be this. That's happened to me so many times. And if I didn't um, come up with my own input and output, I would have just moved on and solved the wrong problem and failed the interview. So, so that is one of the, the most crucial techniques to use to make sure you solve the correct problem. And the next one, um, and the last part of confirming the question is probing the interviewer by asking them questions about the different uh, things that your function can receive. So your function can receive some parameters. And uh, let's say, for example, that your function receives an array of numbers, uh, an array of integers. and uh, you may think to yourself that if this array can take positive integers and negative, it makes everything way more complicated. So what you should do to, uh, uh, to the interviewer is probe them and ask them, hey, can this array that I'm receiving 
take negative uh, input. Is negative input going to break the program? Uh, and chances are the interviewer will turn around and say, uh, uh, no, negative uh, numbers aren't going to ever be uh, given to you. It's, it's always going to be an array of positive numbers. And this is just an example, because not all problems uh, are going to fit this. Um, this is just an example of, of, of how to probe and figure out what the, the values of your, um, of your function should be. Uh, some other things is, let's say that your function receives a string of characters. Uh, then something you might do is you might ask them, uh, can this string be uh, any character? Can it be uppercase and lowercase? Because chances are the interviewer just wants to make it kind of simpler for you. And they might say to you, no, nah, just assume you, you, you will always get lowercase alphabet characters and nothing else. Because that would make the, the implementation of your code so much simpler. And so in this, in this phase, in this confirming the question phase, you can ask these questions to help make your life way, way, way easier when you're coding the problem in the, uh, uh, um, when you actually um, get to the coding portion. So, um, and with uh, this input, if you are getting an array or a, or a big list of numbers, then something else that's really important to ask the interviewer is to ask how big can that array be? Because if your, if your function accepts an array of numbers and, you, and the interviewer says to you, oh, the array w will be no bigger than 50 um, elements long, then what that means is that you can get away with writing a really, really inefficient program because there isn't many numbers there. But if the interviewer turns around and says, no, that, that array could be infinite, it could be a billion, then that's an indication of, what, of how efficient the program that you need to write will need to be. So it's about probing them and getting information to help make your life easier when you're trying to solve the problem. So, um, uh, so algorithm design. Once you have finished uh, confirming the question and you feel pretty damn sure that the question you've been asked uh, is the one you have in your brain and you definitely uh, uh, think you understand what they've asked you to do, you can move on to the algorithm design phase. So if you already know what the optimal solution is, if you already have it in your brain, that's fine. You can go ahead and you should uh, explain the entire algorithm to them, maybe write some pseudocode. Uh, that's great. But most likely when you get asked the problem uh, in an interview, you won't immediately know uh, the answer. So there is a process that is important for you to go through to help solve the problem. The first thing you need to do is you need to solve the problem manually. You, you need to use brute force. Use the most inefficient solution you can think of, anything that is going to simply solve the problem. And once you've done that, once you've thought of this brute force solution, then you can move over to this uh, much more efficient method. And you can move over uh, to, to looking at your... Um, so looking at your brute force solution and thinking about uh, all the things that made that solution inefficient. So what were the bottlenecks? What made it so slow in the first place? And how can you make it better? Are there tricks that you've learned from doing all those hundreds of leak code? Are there tricks on your tool belt uh, that you can pull out and use to help solve this problem and make it better? And there isn't really much I can say here in terms of like, you know, how to make sure you, you will have uh, the answer. Like, to be able to, to know what the, the answer is to make your problem really, um, to make your solution efficient, really just means that you have to do more and more leak code. If you do, uh, you know, lots and lots of leak code, experience many mediums and many hard problems, then that is what's going to allow you to be able to come up with the efficient solution better. Um, and, 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 and in time, because if you can't come up with it, then unfortunately that may be an interview that you don't pass. So that's why the leak code part of it and the, and the practicing problems and learning solutions is so important. So when you get to this phase, phase of the interview, you can just kill it and, and be able to come up with that solution because hopefully 
the, the problem is using some technique or idea that you've seen before. Um, so, uh, once you've uh, come up with uh, the brute force solution um, and the, uh, the, uh, the better solution, for both of them, you should always be uh, coming up and figuring out uh, what exactly are the big O time complexities of these algorithms. So if you come up with a brute force, the really inefficient solution, and you tell the interviewer and you say, hey, uh, this solution is, is n cubed time. That's how, uh, uh, that's how fast it is. It's, it's big O n cubed time. And then uh, uh, the interviewer might want you to be able to explain uh, why is it n cubed time. So simply stating what um, the, the big O time complexity of your algorithm is isn't enough. You need to be able to explain why it's that. Um, and then once you get to the efficient solution, so uh, you need to say, all right, uh, let's say, for, um, for example, that the brute force, the inefficient solution that I came up with was n cubed. Uh, and this better solution is, is n squared or n or n log n, something that's, 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 that is faster and more efficient than n cubed, then you need to explain why exactly uh, it's, it's more efficient. And then uh, once you've finished that, uh, there is a little trick you can use to make sure that you have the correct solution. So it, it's a little... Uh, it's a little bit annoying because here comes the, the second way where you can really easily fail leak code um, or, or, or fail mock interviews or fail real interviews. Um, and that is when you come up with an algorithm and you, you know what its efficiency is and that happened to be the incorrect efficiency. There happened to be a better solution that the interviewer knew in their heads and they simply didn't tell you about it. So you went ahead and you went and uh, completed the entire interview using this algorithm that you came up with that isn't the most efficient algorithm and there is a good chance that you may still fail that interview. So something you're not really allowed to do in, in a real interview is you're not really allowed to say, hey, is, is the answer that I've just come up with correct? Like, like you can't just blatantly say that to them. They don't really want you to say that and um, they've been instructed not to, to respond well to that um, or just to not respond to that at all. So there is still a sneaky way you can still ask that question um, like in a way where you can still get an answer out of them and they'll be okay with it. And to do that, what you need to do is uh, say something like this. Let's say I've just come up with the algorithm that is the most efficient algorithm, and I'm about to start coding it. What I'll say to the interviewer is, hey, this is my algorithm. It's uh, n log n complexity. I am going to go ahead and code up this solution. However, if you, would, if you want me to, I can keep thinking about it, and, and I can definitely come up with a better solution. And uh, up to you. That phrase is exactly what I repeat to every interviewer, every single, every single problem, and you guys should, should have that cemented in your brains, because that is one of the key phrases that allow you to pass Google interviews, is by kind of twisting their arm into giving you information when they don't really want to, because uh, chances are, if you were working on uh, an algorithm that is the wrong um, complexity, and they want you to do a better job, you know, like, you're not asking them, are you correct? You know, you're telling them you can get a better um, uh, algorithm, I even, if you do even if you don't know if you can or not, you say it anyway, because it'll get information from them. So, uh, so that is a way for you to get information from them and be able to know if the, uh, if the answer is correct, um, so if your algorithm complexity is correct. So uh, hopefully when you say that phrase, the interviewer turns around and says to you, uh, yep, I'm happy with that, uh, go ahead and code. And if, if you get that, if, if an interviewer says that to you, that they're happy with, with the, the algorithm you've just come up with, that's a green light. You know you have the correct answer now, and you know what the algorithm is. So assuming you've practiced a lot of coding, boom, you are well on your way to about to pass a Google interview. Then now you need to go on and start coding it. So coding it is nothing like coding uh, in the real world. When you're coding in all of your university assignments or projects or work environment, when you code, 
you are silent. You are thinking to yourself, you're writing stuff on paper, you're in pain trying to figure out the solution. That's all a very natural part of, of programming. And uh, what you don't do when you're programming in the real world is you don't constantly talk at someone while you're coding. That just sounds crazy. But when you're doing an, an, an interview for one of these companies, that's what you have to do. Uh, you need to put on this performance. You need to put on this play. Uh, and, and the way you should do it is something like this. Let's say uh, uh, the code that you're going to write is, I don't know, 20 lines long. Break it up into sections of, of one, two, or three lines. And before you write the code for each few lines of code, uh, what you do is you, you say out loud what you're about to code. It, it sounds weird because, like, why say it? Because you can just write it. Um, but it's, it's something that the, that the recruiters, uh, that the interviewers want to see because if you don't speak constantly throughout the coding process, what they're going to do is they're going to mark you down with an X and they're going to say to you, uh, this candidate doesn't uh, communicate enough. Like, come on, man, we're coding. Like, who, who communicates when, uh, when we're coding? But like, that's, that's a part of the interview and that's part of learning how to pass these things. So to, to fix this, we just talk constantly. We, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say I want to write a while loop uh, that loops through some nodes. What I might say to the interviewer is I'll say, okay, um, uh, I'm going to write this while loop that's going to loop through these nodes and then I'm going to visit uh, each node uh, along the way. And then I'll just close my mouth and I'll just type it out. And then I'll get to the next line and I'll repeat and I'll repeat and I'll repeat. And I'll keep doing that until I finish the whole code. Never, never, never be silent. Um, and when you're writing code as well, uh, the code you write, it needs to be syntactically correct. It needs to be code that would compile if you wrote it um, normally. Don't write pseudocode. Don't write stuff that is um, uh, like not real code. If you pick Python, you need to write syntactically correct Python. If you, uh, and same for all languages. And another thing as well, when you're writing your code, um, if you don't do this already, then you need to start doing it, um, which is to code with proper style. You need to be indenting everything perfectly. If you write names of variables, don't use one letter or two letter variable names. The variables that you write need to be able to be pronounced. They need to be real words and they need to be um, descriptive to explain what the variable is. If you start typing single letter or if you don't indent your code properly, you will just fail because they will just think you're a bad coder because they do have that opinion. People with bad style, they just believe they're bad coders. Don't do that. Just, just learn, to be, uh, uh, learn to be thorough with your style and indent things properly. So, uh, so that's uh, how to make sure that you're coding things correctly. Now, once you've uh, finished the code, uh, then you can move on to the last part of, of answering uh, or of solving this problem, and that is to test your program. If you don't test your pro program, you will likely fail the interview. You need to make sure you're testing the program. The only time you don't test is when you are about to test and the interviewer says, no, 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 don't do that, we can move on. Then you, you know, you're, you, uh, uh, then you can move on and you're fine. But if they don't say that, then you have to test. So when you test, uh, what you're doing is you are running your code uh, in your head. Basically, your brain becomes the CPU because the code that you're writing is actually usually in a Google Doc or something that is not a real text editor. Um, it's not going to actually compile. You don't actually... Um, some companies do compile, but many of the big tech Silicon Valley company internships uh, uh, or uh, Silicon Valley company interviews uh, don't expect you to compile your code, and they, don't, and they don't want you to. So when you test, what you need to do is you, you begin by writing down all the variables in your function. And then you need to step through your entire function line by line. And, and as the function runs and the variables change, you are, you are recording them and writing them down. And same as the coding part, you're talking about it the whole time. So you tell them what line you're up to. OK, now I'm up to this line, and that's going to change this variable. And you keep going uh, until the entire function has finished. And hopefully, the output of, of, of your function matches 
uh, uh, the same output that you uh, came up with back in the confirming the question. Because when you're testing your program, don't come up with some random uh, array or big array of numbers that you haven't seen before. Simply grab the input that was spoken about back at the start of the, of the technical question and just use the same input that you came up with when you were confirming the question. And then when you test your program, then your program should... Um, then when, you, uh, uh, when you're testing your program, the program should output the correct result. Um, the final thing with testing is if you come across uh, a particular part of your code that is a bug and you realize that, oh damn, I've forgotten an if statement here or I've forgotten this or that, really important, don't go back to your code and change it. Um, all you need to do is just verbally say to the uh, interviewer uh, what you would do to fix it. So if you do come across a problem and you've forgotten an if statement somewhere, then simply say to the interviewer, hey, uh, I've got an if statement right here. Uh, uh, I would fix this problem by adding this line of code. And just say it. And that's all they care about. They want to know that you've identified that there is a problem and that you would know how to, uh, how to solve that problem. So, uh, so nearing the end, last couple of slides, uh, when you're going through your um, interview, throughout the entire process, um, something I've already touched upon, but I'm going to just repeat it again because I believe it's really important, is between each section, so confirming the question to algorithm design to, uh, to, to the coding to the testing, whenever you're moving on and you want to make sure that the thing you've just done is correct, always just constantly repeat it like a broken record. Are you okay with this? I'm going to move on now. Uh, uh, this is the question. Uh, I'm going to start coming up with an algorithm. Are you okay with this? All right, my code is finished. Uh, I'm going to start testing now. Are you okay with this? Because it's a way to probe them, to get information out of them, to make sure that, you're, that you haven't missed anything. Um, and uh, like I said as well, uh, throughout this whole interview, you need to be talking constantly. Don't be silent. Um, having large blocks of silence um, can be enough to fail at an interview. Don't be silent for a long time. If for some reason you, you do need to be silent, let's say you really just need to just think about something in your head briefly, um, then what you can do is tell the interviewer, uh, do something uh, that I call controlled silence. You tell the interviewer, hey, I'm going to be silent for a moment because I need to think about this problem. You're telling them that you're going to be silent. You're in control of it. And then once you have finished being silent, you fill the interviewer in in what you're thinking about. Um, and that way, the interviewer isn't too, too worried that you got lost because if you don't do this, the interviewer might think that you're freaking out or they might think that you're, I don't know, like you're cheating. If, like if, if it's a phone interview, they might think you're like silently doing something else. So make sure that the interviewer is aware of why you're silent and, and what you came up with after that silence. And uh, really important as well, when you're going through this interview process, uh, don't go back. So if you've confirmed the question, make sure you finish that completely and move forward. Don't, um, like you don't want to go back to confirming the question. And especially uh, when you come up with a, an, an algorithm design, you don't want to go back and redesign the algorithm once you start coding. If you start coding in an interview, then that is the program you're, you're doing and you're not doing anything else. Um, just, just move forward because there usually isn't enough time and the interviewer might be looking at their watch because they want to give you and ask you another question. So, like, so they don't have time for you to, to mess around too much on this one problem. So move forward and don't, and don't go back. Um, so the final slide of this talk is uh, how to grade your interviews. So like I said before, when you're doing your mock interviews, you've paired up. There's, um, there's a friend or, like, or, there may, or there may be a group of you and you're all doing mock interviews together, improving together. And when you give an interview to one of your friends, then at the end of the interview, you really should be grading them. So that means uh, the different, six different categories that I have explained uh, in this section is you need to be uh, giving them a grade for the, their behavioral part at the very start uh, and for the confirming the question, for the algorithm design, uh, and for all the other parts of this. And 
And what you want to be doing is grading them in a way that helps them improve. And the way I, I do it is this. Uh, if the interviewee, so if, if you're the interviewer and the person you interviewed uh, just barely passed the behavioral se um, question, for example, uh, then you give them a five. If they killed it and they did really well, that's a 10 and a zero, obviously, if, if they just didn't do very well at all. So uh, use that as your metric. A five is just a pass. And you do that for every category of the interview. And the, and the rule is that every single one of the grades needs to be a minimum of five. If any single one of the grades is below five, then you deem that the interviewee has failed the mock interview because that means they can't just focus all their attention on algorithm design and coding and neglect testing because, uh, because, they keep, um, because they'll keep failing the mock interview because they might keep getting a one or a two for the testing part. So you need to make sure that uh, it's, it's not easy to pass these mock, uh, mock interviews and using this grading system will make it so you keep each other accountable and you can grow together as a team. So that's everything I know about how to get a Silicon Valley company uh, internship. Thank you.